I'm at the Indie Entertainment Summit. Hello, I welcome to another Road to Hollywood. We've got a spectacular show for you tonight. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's going to be nonstop music, memories, and of course, information on how to move ahead in today's business because it is crazy. It is constantly changing. Without further ado, I want to get straight to our guest. He is a veteran. We personally go back like 30 years, so you can imagine the amount of stories. Uh, someone I respect, he's an author, he's an executive, he's an advisor, he's a consultant. He has gone inside the belly that makes a hit and it makes a great artist. And he is Dan Compel. Welcome to the Road to Hollywood. Well, thank you so much. Good to be here, my brother. It is so good to have you. Because like I say, uh, early on when I moved to L.A. in 1980, one of the first things I had heard about was the L.A. Songwriter Showcase. And up on Hollywood Boulevard and then over on La Brea and wherever it moved to, it was a place where some of the actual pros in the industry came out of the ivory towers and they came down and actually met the peons. You know, the guys that had just moved here from Iowa and were slanging their songs. And all of a sudden, they not only had some great feedback, but they had professionals that would actually listen to music and sometimes take it home. And I remember it blew my mind because one of the songs I had heard when I first was at a session few months later the record was out somebody had cut it and it was an exciting time and uh, our, our, our condolences and certainly great uh, memories you know with the great late John Brohini and his partner Lynn Chandler uh, what was the greatest memories of that and what got you actually in this business yeah. Wow, 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 wow. Well, I'm originally from Ohio. I'm from a little town called Lima, Ohio. So obviously the first thing I had to do in the music business, Jay, was figure out how to get the hell out of Lima, Ohio, you know? But it was really simple because the villagers came with the torches and the pitchforks in the middle of the night, like, kill the monster and, uh, and get out of there. So um, I was in a band. I was a musician. I was a songwriter. We ended up in Nashville, Tennessee. And I lived in Nashville for a year. Great place to be. Good song town. Not my kind of town. I went to New York City. I was in New York City for five years doing the music grind, and I moved to Los Angeles. And when I got to L.A., you know, the people I was working with said, you know, you need to meet some folks. And so I, I checked out the Los Angeles Songwriters Showcase, and it became a real revelation for me, not only as a writer, because, but, but the other parts of my career. And I realized that even though I loved writing songs and I was a really, really strong musician, I could do that. I wasn't the best in the world, and I wanted to do something that I was really, really great at. And so it was very humbling for me to have to reinvent myself over and over. But the Los Angeles Songwriter Showcase had a little magazine, and they needed somebody aggressive to sell advertising space in their little magazine. And Lord knows I'm aggressive. I had a lot of ambition. So I started doing that, and then I began writing for that magazine. It led to my first book deal. So a lot of the things that happened to me happened because I was in the right place at the right time, but putting out the right energy. And I knew how to work it, baby. You got to work it, you know? So well, that's it, it. Again, there's no manual to how to make it, certainly in Hollywood, the entertainment, the music business, none of that. But it all comes down to that perseverance, that knowledge, those connections. And I know one, one factor is you got to be patient. Everybody says, don't stop, stay in there, hang in there. Find a niche of what you believe in. So rather than jump on the trend or, or follow these guys, lead somewhere, even if they're not in front of you. I remember when I hit L.A. and bands like Motley Crue were jumping off on the strip. and They didn't look or sound like anybody else. Yeah. And they blazed a trail. And before you knew it, there was 5,000 bands that looked and sounded like them. And that is innovators. And, and we love it. No matter what style of music. Singer, songwriter, alternative music was born during this era. Uh, all, all this was so such a you know, fertile time you know, for the music business. And it's always great to associate in, in network. And, you know, I learned that early on. It's, they say it's not, you know, who you know, or, you know, what you know, but who you know. No, it's a combination of everything. It's what you know, who you know, and how you work it. Oh, who you know, what you know, who knows you <laughs> is, is, is Uncle Dan's theory on yes, that, you know. Yes. So, yeah, man, uh, the people chops. I learned early on being the kind of person other people wanted to see succeed was a huge part of that. And, you know, that's that's something you can't really learn. That's sort of like who you are as a person, you know, what, what your what your moral compass is, what your sense of ethics, how much you're willing to give back to other people. You know, if you want other people to help you in this business, you have to help them. You have to support them. If you want to want people to hear what you got going on, you have to be concerned about what they've got going on, you know. Yeah. So there's a lot of give and take in this business. And as you say, a lot of it is timing and a lot of it is is putting yourself out there. But, you know. 
creative people sometimes have a very difficult time putting themselves into social situations. So we'll talk about that later on in yeah. part three of this. But putting yourself out there, letting people get your vibe and letting people really know who you are. You know, it's a social business as well. And even the, all the technology in the world won't change that dynamic. Of course. I mean, it's such a combination of all those elements, you know. Everybody's looking for the, the shortcut. You know, how do I get from here to being a superstar with lots of money and, and the fame? And, of course, you know, that ne never happens. Even even if it did happen, you probably wished it wouldn't because it was probably like Psy or whoever. They might be over as quickly as they came, especially these days. But, you know, it, it is so much of, of that, of being a student of the game, really loving what you're doing, totally immersing yourself. So whether it's one-on-one -on -one meetings or developing relationships, developing your creative side, the business side, because it, again, it's show business. So you can show all day long, but if nobody's handling the business, somebody's going to probably take it away from you. And, you know, uh, after a while, you really can't feel too much sympathy because that book has been written. You've got to get your team together, get your paperwork, your business, all of that. So it starts with great music. But it certainly doesn't end there. And, and that's what we're talking about. I know you go back to the legendary 70s and, of course, that fertile 80s with the birth of MTV and everything. Now, I know you've interviewed thousands of artists. Yeah, yeah. And we're talking about songs because we had the Guns N' Roses show last week. And I'm telling you, not only did those guys take over the world and sell hundreds of millions and, you know, do every fantasy that probably every rock star dreamed of, but... It was about the songs. If we didn't have Welcome to the Jungle and Sweet Child of Mine and Paradise City and all those legendary songs, we wouldn't be talking about it. Sure. They would have been one of the hundreds of bands that Geffen or MCA or, or A&M or Chrysalis or all these labels signed, and they're in the cutout bins. You're lucky if people pay a dollar for them. And you know they spent probably millions to, to get them there. So talk about some of those elements of really after interviewing the, so many people, yeah. what some of those common elements were that, that made a successful artist and, of course, made that song? Well, you know, it, it's such an interesting thing. And I, I have been so fortunate and so blessed to interview everybody from Holland Dozier Holland, the great Motown architects that wrote Reach Out, I'll Be There and Baby Love and all the all the Diana Ross and Four Top <laughs> stuff, all the way through a poet like Leonard Cohen, who a lot of people really, really revere. And uh, and then, of course, more modern age. I have recent interviews with people like Bruno Mars, Katy Perry, Adam Levine, James Valentine from Rune 5. You know, the song thing... Um, there's there's an accessibility in in great rock songs or great pop songs. There's something to grab onto. There's a piece of something that people can take away with them. So I always like to talk about very specific things in songs. I like I like songs about places. You know, I like songs about months. You know, a cold November rain by Guns N' Roses or songs that really kind of grab onto what in Nashville they refer to as furniture in the song. You know, it's a good song, but it needs some furniture in it. And you say, well, what does that mean? Okay, a door closed. What kind of door was it? Was it a screen door? Was it a chip screen door? Was it a blue screen door? Was it a heavy metal door? What kind of door was it, right? So specificity in songwriting, I think, is a real part of that. Also, when you think about writing, don't write about your life. Write about other people's lives. You know, look at those common chords. And there's a lot to be garnered by examining the great songs of all eras because they're really, really not that different. The thing that's different in songwriting right now is that there are six or eight songwriters per song. Mm. And one of those reasons is because the sales of CDs have receded, as, as we know. So a lot of writers are really putting themselves in positions they want the strongest possible song of all. So if I think of a song like Payphone, you know, by, by Maroon 5, there's six writers on that. There's Benny Blanco, there's Amar Malik, you know, there's, uh, there's a guy named Robopop, there's Adam, there's James, you know, there's Shellback. There's a lot of different writers that are bringing their perspective to the song to give us the strongest possible song. So sometimes in co-writing songs, I've had, had writers say to me, sometimes you have to throw out your great idea for somebody's lesser idea, but that lesser idea makes the song better. You know, yeah. so there's an egoless part of the songwriting that really has to happen right now. Yeah. So, you know, I think about about the Smeezing Tins, which is Bruno Mars, you know, uh, Ari Levine and, and Philip Brown and, and, and what they do. And each of them brings a separate perspective to the right of the song. But of course, it's Bruno's voice that puts it out there. Mm -hmm. So songwriting business is uh, is a political game, as it has always been. There are camps of people here in Los Angeles. Um, I think. One of the trends I see right now are DJs as co-writers, people like David Guetta, um, you know, a VC, 
uh, Diplo, people like that that are really kind of pushing the electronica agenda in combination with pop songs. But that's what's happening now. If you try to do that now, by the time you get that happening, it's going to be something else. So yeah. what's coming up next? Yeah. Well, that's what's so crazy about pop. We think about the 60s, the 70s, and those classic pop songs that just live forever in the sound. Yeah. But today they're all chasing that dragon of what's the sound right now? Two years from now, what's that going to sound like? You yeah. know, is is really amazing, the evolution. And I mean, we're, we're like almost 60 years on from the Brill building and the people in a room, you know, with a pad, you know, writing every day like it's mm -hmm. it's it's their life, uh, the Holland Dozier Hollands in, in the world. But um, it seems like, these days, it's such big business, like you say, those couple majors that are left, they're in there trying to build the perfect yep. Frankenstein build every the time. Beast. Build the beast. How much money, you get Dr. Luke and, and, and these guys and, mm -hmm. and Max Martin, and, and, you know, before you know it, like you say, there's five, six, seven writers. Easily. Easily. There's, and if there's a sample, yeah, then, then, hundreds then, of then, you've got, then you've got more writers because they're also crediting the cats that, that, that did the original sample. Yeah, so it, it's definitely a different era. You know, uh, of course, when Michael Jackson sold uh, a zillion, you know, Thriller and Bad, um, you know, it, it's Katy Perry can still have the same number ones that he did, but they're selling a fraction of what, sure. what he did. Sure, so. but Katy's also got the clout thing going on in merchandising, so there you go. That's beautiful. I well, it. I know we are just getting started. Our guest tonight is Dan Compel. He's an author, he's a consultant, he's a music business veteran. And like myself, we have a great passion for this. So we're going to cut to a little break. This is some of the industry pros that came to IES this year. The legendary Violet Brown. The, she was one of the biggest record buyers in the business. If Violet didn't bring a record in, it didn't matter who was spinning it, if MTV was playing it. If he couldn't sell it in the stores, it wasn't a hit. And Brian Shafton, who is now the label manager and running one of the most Biggest independent success stories out there. He runs the labels for Tech Nine, who's the independent legend right now. Uh, E40 and Too Short and DJ Quick and so many of these artists exhibit who were formerly multi-platinum on major labels and now do steady business independently through RBC and our friend Brian Shafton. So let them tell you what they think of IES. And we're going to be back more with The Road to Hollywood coming right up. Entertainment Summit, IES, and we're here in NoHo, North Hollywood. Uh, it's in my neck of the woods, which is the entertainment capital of the world, and this is the first of many to come, I believe, of uh, these conferences. It's uh, four or five days, and last night, yesterday was the first day, I was on a panel. I came out here and, along with Jerry Heller, who's a legend in the business, Steve LaBelle, who's a legend in the business. We were on a panel together. There were many panels yesterday. There's a ton of new artists here, new record labels here. I asked, uh, where are people from? There's a guy here that I met from New Zealand. Uh, any state that you can think of in the United States, there's somebody here representing that state. It's pretty wild that this is the first one and there's just so many people from all over the world, I guess, here. Um, last night I saw some great talent. I usually come to these events and I'm here maybe during my panel and then I meet a few people and I take off. Last night I stayed after my panel. I met a ton of people. I got some great demos while I was here and I actually stayed for a showcase and I stayed till the bitter end last night. I stayed until the bar closed. I wasn't drinking, just watching music. I stayed until 2 a.m. and then I wanted to come back again today. I'm not on a panel today, but I wanted to be here because this is happening. There's so many people here and so many people that may need my help and so many people that I can learn from and I can pick up some new music from. I'm just so excited about this and if this is the first one, I can't wait to see what happens here next year. This is pretty amazing. Uh, Jay has put on an amazing show, an amazing conference. People are really getting something out of this one. Right now on stage is Ted Cohen, who is the guru of 
uh, digital. Uh, this guy, he, I used to work with him for a little while at Warehouse. He went on to work at all the, the major record labels in digital. He's here right now dropping his knowledge on kids and people that may not know anything about the business and I guarantee you they're going to leave here knowing something about the digital business just from meeting Ted. I mean it's a who's who on the panels. The panels are all saying something, they're meaningful, they're uh, there are panels that people are really going to get some good education from legends in the business and people know what they're talking about. So I'm so excited about this. I'll probably be here tomorrow. I'll probably come back on Saturday evening. It's so great. Uh, again, Jay, you put on a great show and thank you for inviting me to be on a panel and to hang out. My name is Brian Schaff and I'm a partner at RBC Records, home to the largest urban independent acts including Tech 9 E40, DJ Quick, Exhibit, and many more. I'm here at the first annual IES convention. I was on a panel today, which I volunteered for. I'm all about my business, so some people might say, why are you doing this panel for free? The reason I'm doing it for free is so I can educate these artists as to what to do and I expect to be able to find someone this year or next year that I can actually sign to my label and work with as they have this experience and this knowledge that's empowered and impacted uh, by all of these tremendous industry heavyweights out here. It's an unbelievable opportunity if you're an artist, if you're an online marketing company, if you're a label owner, if you want to network, this is the place to be. It's chock full of people, chock full of important people. It's something I plan on being next year. It's somewhere that I'm going to look to sign new artists from, assuming that they take everyone's advice. And there's no way you're going to have an opportunity to meet with all of these people under one roof in Los Angeles, the home of the music business. I look forward to seeing you next year. Thank you so much. We're back on the road to Hollywood. Some incredible words from the, the legends, Brian Shafton, Violet Brown. They're among over 100 of the movers and shakers that will be there to teach you their success techniques, how they do this. And that's one great thing about the independent world is we're all very giving of our information because there's no secret formulas. There is no shortcuts. You can learn how any of these legends did it, and it's not going to guarantee that you're going to do it the same way. But as we spotlight the amount of success stories right now in the independent world from Macklemore and Tech Nine there and, and from Joe Bonamassa to, um, you know, all, all these incredible. Mac Miller having the number one album in the country with no record deal. Uh, again, our guest tonight is Dan Campbell. He is a veteran, got decades in the business. He has got such a passion for the music. Like him, I discovered very early on as a musician at a very, very early age that I could help more people if I crossed over to that business side and actually be that bridge, that vital bridge between the creative and business side. Because I saw that artists, you know, were very expendable. You know, the, the guitarist could be replaced by the guitarist who's replaced by a drum machine, who's replaced by a computer. You know, so we've dedicated our lives to helping you, the creative community, move forward and have people that you can trust that really don't want to nickel more or less than you've agreed to. And that's what's great. Dan, tell us about, you know, the importance of a team, because, you know, we know how important a song is. A song lives forever. But these days to be a vital touring, merchandising, selling uh, artist that's getting, you know, play and exposure and endorsements and, and with all the opportunities that are out there. Let's talk a little bit about the team. What are some of the common or most important elements you see in, in a success story? Well, a belief system is first, of course, Jay. Uh, creating music that, that other people can identify and want to project out there into the marketplace. I mean, it, it's interesting because there, there are no magic people that appear out of the woodwork to make you successful. You know, I, I think that sometimes artists have this thing. They're like, oh, I just want to be creative, man. So, uh, you know, I want somebody else to handle the business. Well, we've seen historically what happens when artists keep themselves ignorant of the business. So the per first, first thing is, 
you know, the artist has to do everything that they can do within their power to take themselves to the level where they need to go. When it becomes too much for them, a lot of things organically will happen sort of at the same time. Uh, whether it's a manager, whether it's a publicist, I see a lot of, of, of really interesting independent publicity firms right now that are, that are working with artists to kind of project them and get them to the next level. But what we're talking about here is getting an audience, you know, and everybody... That, that needs to be successful as an artist needs to project to an audience. So they need to examine really who comes, who comes first. Sometimes it's a publisher, okay? We, because record labels no longer are in the business of developing artists, sometimes independent publishers or major music yeah. publishers will do A&R work and they will sign artists on a publishing situation, build them to a point, help them get their thing going on and then project them as artists. I saw that with Elliot Yamin. You know, uh, so so that can be a team member. A team member can be uh, really anybody that takes them to the next level. But uh, everybody wants to get on the train that's up and running, and that sure. has never changed. So it's up to the artist to create a momentum to draw that energy into them, okay? And then to be able to examine what it is that they need. What do they? What does the artist like to do? You know, mm -hmm. do they need a webmaster? Do they need a social media person? Do they need a publicist? Do they need a conventional publicist? Do they need an agent to help them get out into the college market? You know, there are any number of elements that are going to fall into place. But the good thing is they're all connected, okay? And when there's good music and there are viable artists, you know, there, there are incredible support networks of people in Los Angeles and worldwide that are looking for these kinds of opportunities, you know. I know artists that get signed have been signed off of Facebook. There's obviously artists that have been signed off of YouTube. But those artists have taken the momentum to create something that other people can see, fixed it in a tangible form. And when it's in a tangible form and gives off a vibe, other people can then become involved. Yeah, it's so important, you know, the, the team effort and, and having a real solid team. You know, we, we see so many artists come and go, you know, so many careers dashed from that wrong move or, or someone that just didn't have the foresight to, you know, really look under every rock or, or explore every opportunity. And um, I mean, we love all these memories that we have. And again, last week we had an incredible Guns N' Roses, you know, story and, and the people that were actually there when they broke. But you know, I liken it too to, you know, I, I had the very uh, distinct honor of, of being a part of the promotional team when you two came out and to see those guys uh, 30 some years later to be the same four guys and the same manager in the same room when they were in a garage you know, taking over the world and setting a record at the the Rose Bowl. And their their last tour was the biggest grossing tour in history. Um, and then a, a group like Guns N' Roses, as much as we love the music, they came after you two, imploded after one album, and all the millions in the world couldn't produce a hit with Chinese democracy, you know, 20 years later. So not, not taking anything away from the music. It is legendary. But they made one album. You, you two is probably on their 14th album yep. or something. And we can go back to the to the Eagles or, or any of the groups that are still around today, Bruce Springsteen or whoever. But it's the consistency. You know, Bruce Springsteen, I know, has had the same manager since like 74, yeah. 75. John Landau, yeah. yeah, so it's it's really about having that team. You know, Pearl Jam, they got Kelly Curtis. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's all these people that, you know, they kind of, these days you can insulate yourself from all the craziness. You can have your booking agent, your manager, your publisher, your distributor. These days, do you really need that record company? I mean, are you ready to, to sign over 360 degrees and your likeness and, and your URL and your trademark? And, and, and you know what's amazing? It used to be so bad where it was like one album with a whole bunch of options. But I've heard now the majors, it's, it's not one plus six, it's zero plus seven. Yep. They really can't even guarantee that you're going to put out any albums. And that's amazing to it's it's funny to see the young artists are not funny. It's really sad. But to, to see them in such a hurry to sign something yeah. that they don't really know what it involves. But at the same time, we're talking about all these valuable agents and managers and marketing teams and distributors that all need to be fed for a healthy beast to continue. But they're ready to sign all the rights away to somebody who won't guarantee they'll even put out one. When they come in with, with some momentum, it's interesting. I, I interviewed Green Day 
And they're, they're a really interesting example of a band that went out on the road on their own as an independent band. Get in the van. Uh, they got, well, they had, what they had was a bookmobile. <laughs> it was a reconverted bookmobile. Wow. And they went and, and crashed on fans' floors. And yeah. so by the time that they finally got to Warner Brothers, they were like, hey, what can you do for us? We know what we can do for ourselves. We've already built it up. So that's a prototype, in a way, for independent music that happens now. Yeah. You know, by the time it gets there, you know, Ray LaMontagne, same kind of thing. He already had established himself as an artist and so by the time he, he came in he actually came through chrysalis publishing and then and then into the record deal so the more that you can do on your own the more clout you can create and you can create a tremendous amount of clout on your own sync is a part of that songs and film and television yeah. you know the music supervisors don't care what the sources are as long as the music fits what it has to do but this is an interesting thing sometimes jay i'll meet people go yeah i'd like to get my songs on film and television i'm like well what's what television shows you think would be good for your songs they're like i don't know i don't watch tv so you got to do the due diligence you have to really understand the emotional yeah. quotient understand it's not about the song it's about the use of the song and kind of understand how that world works as well yeah. when we were coming up my brother when we were coming up there were secrets we didn't know how this worked we were Coming up, there was oh. information was not there. Yeah. It is there now. Yeah. You no, know. the ivory towers had guards at the gate. You know, you couldn't get past the secretary even then. Now they got voicemail there. You can't even get past. <laughs> you can't even get to the secretary. But you know, it's it's funny how those ivory towers. It's it's kind of like the Wizard of Oz. We went around back. We we looked yeah. behind the curtain. Yeah. It, that's a record company. Wait a minute. All a record company is is promotion, marketing, distribution, a little production, and some administrative. Wait a minute. We can do that on our own. Why, why would you give away the ownership of something? And, and, and what's amazing about a record deal is you can recoup. You can sell 10 million copies. They've made a zillion times back their profit, but they still own it. Yeah. It's, it's like getting a loan for a house, sure. paying it back. But guess who still owns the house? Sure, sure. You know? and, and we talk about independent labels now, too, because we're looking at, at the percentage of 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 smaller indie labels, which is which is very viable. Well, Motown Records was an indie label as well. Sun Records was an indie label as well. Atlantic Records, Interscope, Interscope was, was an indie label. label. Sure. So all of those started as, as indie labels. So I, I think when we talk about music. We're talking about a community of creative people. I believe that everything comes out of a scene. Nothing exists on its own. So when Guns and Roses came up, there were a number of other bands at that same time that that had an ideology that had a certain ethos that had a certain yeah. fashion sense that had a certain yeah. sensibility so i believe that music always will come out of those particular dynamics not yeah. uh, not everybody within that scene will be projected to that level mm -hmm. but there need to be a number of things for the creation of a scene there has to be an, a listening audience there needs to be a visual component there needs to be a young audience that really will be passionate about what they do so you know whether that's in Seattle or whether it's in Oklahoma City or Detroit or any of these other places, it can now come up out of those places, you know? So that's the thing. But you will have to, at some point, come to Los Angeles. <laughs> All roads lead to Hollywood, believe me. Yes, uh, they do. Sooner or later, everything emanates from Southern California to the world, whether it be entertainment, fashion, you know, sports, whatever. It's, uh, you know, it's a hotbed for activity. But, you know, what's uh, amazing about that is in building your team, like I say, it's, so many people are in a rush to, I need a manager. I need an agent. They don't understand. These are exclusive contracts that yes. are usually multi-years. Yes. Then all of a sudden, when the real manager comes up, they're like, we're interested in signing you. Now the, the, you think the other guy just wants to bow out? Uh -huh. I mean, there, there's too many stories of situations where artists were quick to sign because they thought they needed this, or I need a record deal. I need to impress my friends and family. You know, I got a record deal. But now all of a sudden, they've gone from being in control. We've seen so many independent artists have such great success independently. They got signed. And then what happened? They never put out a record. They got dropped. They they broke up. It, it stopped being fun. Yeah. yeah. And now it was like, who are we waiting for? We, we were on fire, and now we're waiting for yeah. some guy. And that guy left the label who signed us, and... They haven't decided what they're going to do with us. <laughs> or they don't know what to do. There's some tragic stories about that. There's a, a young man in my, I'm, I'm not going to say his name, but he had done four independent records out of the Midwest, did very, very well, moved to Los Angeles, wrote on some huge records, got signed to Warner Brothers, did one record, and Warner Brothers had no idea what to do with him or how to market him. So uh, now he's back doing the independent thing, and he's much happier doing that. So not all artists need to be signed, certainly, and especially in this era. I, certainly a major label can 
can can apply certain marketing pressure or techniques once things have been proven, but yeah. they first have to be proven. So it has to go yeah. to that level first. Well, like, like I tell, it, it's funny when artists come to me and they say, should I go indie? I said, you already are indie. You are indie. You s- perfect your independence is what you need to do. You need to be doing what you do so well that other companies are knocking like, can we get a piece of it? We know we can't own you. You're way too smart for that. Can we get some crumbs off the bat? It's like Jay-Z. You know, Rock, Rock Nation just announced a deal last week with Universal. And the tail is wagging the dog. They go in there and they say, no, we're going to own everything. You're not going to own any of this. You're going to put up these budgets. This is how you're going to spend it. This is how you're going to account to us. This is what we got coming and this is what we need you to do. We're going to give you a few points. We got a deal? Of course we got a deal. Sure. Of a few points and crumbs off that cake is a whole lot better than nothing. And it's amazing that the tail is now wagging the dog. And it's all about leverage. And, and don't tell me, oh, well, that's Jay-Z. No, no. Jay-Z, when he put his first album on priority, was not selling at all. And he, you know, uh, parlayed one move into the other. And he didn't just become what he is, you know. These are strategic business moves. These are about getting a team together. And he cleared house. You know, he got rid of the Rockefeller and he formed Rock yeah. Nation. And, you know, we saw it. Rick Rubin left Def Jam and he started Def American, which became American, which yeah. look what Rick is doing with the Adele record and everybody and from the Chili Peppers to Lincoln Park. I mean, it's amazing the longevity that people have in the business. If, if they surround themselves, you know, with good people, they're are there for the right reasons. And yes, it does start with music. It is, it is yeah. a creative business, but it is so much more after that, you know. And, uh, of course, a lot of the artists complain that, well, that song I'm hearing isn't as good as what I have. Well, get out there and campaign. Yeah. Do pe- you know, it's, it's not one guy deciding, especially with Internet radio, satellite radio, all the music websites out there. There's not one gatekeeper. So don't tell me that MTV's not playing your record or Clear Channel didn't add you. We don't need them. You know, it's great if you got them, but we're looking at too many success stories, you know, that don't have them. And, and, and look at Macklemore. Macklemore has them. He's number one on, on all the charts, and he still did not need to sign a record yeah. deal or sign his rights over to anyone. So it can be done, and, and we're here to celebrate that. You know, the, the, the team is obviously, you know, the, the next most important thing after the music because that's what stands – the balance, you know, when we talk about Guns N' Roses imploding, it was like these guys were a little shaky, <laughs> especially the guys from Indiana. But, you know, when you, when you put a lot of money in their hands and a lot of drugs, a lot of crazy things can happen. Oh, yeah. And how many managers they go through? Vicky, you got out just in time mm-hmm. because, you know, Alan Niven into Dove Goldstein into, you know, it, it became a revolving door. Irving Azoff actually even managed them at one point. I mean, like like Vicky says, it's impossible to manage the unimaginable. Yes. You know? So it, it's pretty amazing, you know, uh, and it's the reason why Slash is doing so well now. He's completely solo. He's independent. He puts out the records when he wants, put his band together, got a good booking agent, found a great singer, Miles Kennedy, and they just rock. And they go get the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and there's no drama. Yeah. You know, they're, they're proud to have it. Are you kidding me? Gilby Clark grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. A lot of these guys you know, dreamed of uh, the artists that they're now shoulder to shoulder with. So, you know, we're very excited. Uh, Tonight, Dan Campbell is our guest. We're talking so deep about, again, the makings of what it takes to have a successful career, to have a hit song, to make it in the music business today. The entertainment world is, it's really breaking down all the barriers, music and movies and reality TV and merchandising and DJs and comedy. It's, it's become more one than, than ever before. We're excited about that. We're going to go back. Uh, this is Steve Lobel. And, and I got to apologize. Steve is a little uh, passionate about his business. So uh, not for the meek. This is more behind the scenes with some executives who are going to tell it like it is about IES and why you need to be there August 7th through the 11th. More with The Road to Hollywood coming right back. What's up, it's Steve Lobel, CEO of A to Z Entertainment. You think you know about the music industry, you think you know about the film business, the TV business, the entertainment business. If you're not here at IES convention, then you ain't in it. 
I've been doing this over 25 years, and I'm here. There's so many other people who are next to me speaking on the panel, colleagues, friends, and they're here taking their time out to give back to you guys. So you get what you put into it. Patience and sacrifice equal success. So if you're not at the IES, IES convention, you ain't in it. You need to get it. It's the first annual one. So many more years to come. So much to learn. There's so much knowledge here. It's not just on a and or producing or TV. It's on all genres and all aspects of the entertainment business. And the entertainment business is global and there's different parts of it. So make sure you come out and support next time for the IES convention. It's Steelo Bell, Aiders Entertainment. I'm humbled and blessed that I spoke on the panel yesterday. You fucking missed it. I was on the fucking panel with legends, Violet Brown and Jerry Heller. Today, Brian Shafton was on, and the list goes on. Last night, you missed it. Chino XL, Tech 9 Skyped in. Spice One was here, Alcoholics. Jesus Christ. Like, where the fuck are you? IES convention. I'm sorry to curse, but I'm passionate. I love what I do. And if you love the music industry, you have to have passion. And I have passion. I've been doing this a long time. So once again, shout out to Jay, the founder of IES convention. It's Steve Lobel, AZ Entertainment. Peace. Hey, Tom Jackson here. Came all the way from Nashville to attend this event because it's an important event. Hey, if you're gonna learn about what you're gonna do, you need to come to this event because it talks because you gotta you've got to learn how to do this thing right. This, this is an interesting business, it's a career. You just can't walk in and and do it. You've got to understand what the heck you're doing. And this is the place to do it, the IES event. Oh, hey, I'm Scott Page. Very thankful to be here at IES today. Had a blast. Great panel, great stuff. A little controversy. Sorry, Moses. Uh, anyway, we had a blast. These are really important, these kinds of conferences. And it's just wonderful to see what's going on now in the independent world. Because, ladies and gentlemen, this is the greatest time in history for the independent. This bar none. You got distribution, you got low cost tools, you can build audience, you can now really start to make some money. So the key is go get that thousand true fans. That'll run. That'll, you can. Pay, that'll pay you $100 a year, and you're making 100 grand a year, independent dude. So let's make it happen. Come to these conferences. They're good. Having a blast. Wonderful bunch of people. And thank you, Jay. You rock, baby. For having me. See you later. Bye. <laughs> I just did the Indie Entertainment Summit. It was actually really cool. You should come down here and see it. A lot of people now have a lot more information that you don't. So next year, maybe you'll learn. Thanks. What's up, this is Jazzy from Jazzy Management. Participated in the IES. Hey, if you missed this, I don't know what you're thinking about. You're calling yourself an artist? You're not an artist if you wasn't here. It's crazy. I mean, I don't even know what to say. I don't even know where to begin. But check this out. Next year, or the year after that, the year after that, since you missed this one, you better make the next one. The IES, I mean, off the chain. Shouts out to everybody that came and got this game, got this knowledge with all the panels. Not one, not two, not three, but multiple panels with multiple information. I mean, you know, if you if you wanted to learn about any anything about the entertainment game, you should have been here. 
and you call yourself an artist, you call yourself a manager, you call yourself a producer, you call yourself whatever, you should have been here. Jazzy, and I'm pushing, and I'm down with the IES 100%. Peace. Thank you so much. We're back on the road to Hollywood. Again, behind the scenes, IES. It is August 7th through the 11th this year. It is in the incredible NoHo Arts District, which is is Hollywood, is LA, is Southern California, but it's off, just right off of Universal Studios where it, it feels very, very artistic and you're not in the middle of traffic and tourist city. So come on out, go to the site, isfest.com, get registered, get your performance slot together, get your plan together. Because last year we had people from over 20 countries, all 50 states, and we're looking to grow it every year. Um, one of the biggest differences, it's funny when people said another music conference. No, no, it's, it's all independent and it's all entertainment. And I don't know any of them that are. They're either too techy and not to put anybody else down, but they're, they're too niche. You know, it's just songwriters or it's just filmmakers or it's just that. And what we're really trying to do is embrace all of entertainment because even as a musical act, you need to have that camaraderie with those filmmakers and the, the, the dancers and the actors and the DJs and, you know, so much more is out there. There's no rules. Some of the people that are winning right now, we're going to talk about Joe Bonamas and some of these guys, they're, they're going left field. They don't, they don't even care about the mainstream radio play. As long as they can reach their audience and they do what they do, they're, they're not having to duck TMZ. They're not having to recoup millions and millions of dollars on a simple making of an album. And it's exciting to see all that. Again, our guest tonight is Dan Campbell. He's an author of many books we're going to be talking about. He is a, 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 consec, a, a, a consultant, a, a, a veteran. I mean, it's a hybrid. How do you even describe yourself, Dan? Wow, it's hard sometimes. I, I usually <laughs> say author, educator, music journalist, because I have an educational component to my career yeah. as well, which is I'm a faculty member at Musicians Institute in Hollywood. Yeah. Uh, about 10 hours a week, which is just enough. Um, I, I spend a lot of time with 18, 19, 20-year-olds, and so I absorb their musical tastes, and I, uh, I get to be a lot hipper than a lot of people my, uh, with, my, with my, my years do. Yeah. And, and I'm really grateful for that particular dynamic in my career. But that was an offshoot of being an author, was becoming an educator. They figured if you were smart enough to write a book, maybe you could educate people, too. Sure. So, you know? Well, let's talk about relationships, because, again, we're talking about networking now and the importance of being an event like IES and being able to not only succinctly present what you do. Some people call an elevator pitch or something because we see a lot of these conferences where the guy steps off the podium and, and it's like shark feeding sure. it's it's like you know and it's like if you if you had three seconds to like hand somebody a demo or a card you were lucky what imagine if you had two minutes uninterrupted to be able to present who you are what you have to offer what you've done already on your own and some of the energies and the teammates and the accolades and things that you're getting so that person would, number one, maybe want an extended meeting. Two, might want to really dig deep, you know, and, and actually want to hear your music or watch your movie or check out your video. And three, actually consider being a collaborator, an investor, a, you know, uh, a, a person that's going to make something happen. And that's, that's what really, you know, one of the things we teach is, is really it's um, these moments, the people that we put in front of you on, on these stages and these opportunities, they're almost impossible to get on the phone. You can imagine how busy these executives are. If they get a call and it's Joe Blow on line three, do you think they're taking that call? It, you know, if they don't know you, you're not getting through. So this is one of the really great opportunities to make a good first impression, leave them with your business card, Hopefully get a contact information, have a professional follow-up where they want to do business. They, they like you as a person. Maybe they're rooting for you. I've seen it time and time again where the guy just had a great energy. The girl or the band had an energy about him. And that person just went out of their way to just you know, sneak that door open. And guess what? Once they got in, they had their team together. They had a professional attitude. And they just they shot all the way up. 
Yeah. Likeability is a big I mean, part we, of that. Yeah, you know? we just saw yeah. Lincoln Parks manager, yeah. a little band from Calabasas yeah. in the Valley. They had some great songs. They put together a team, and look, they, they rock the world every time they come out with an album. So, you know, we're, we're excited about celebrating all that. Talk about, again, the importance of networking, what it's all about to be at events like this, like IS, and, and, and really be able to sure. build that rapport and, and have people want to do business with you. Well, you know, networking is the only word we have for it right now. And sometimes when you hear that word, it sounds like 1989. Mm-hmm. The guy was like shellacked hair on late night TV, going to tell you how to network your way in the music business. Uh-huh. The truth of networking is it's personal relationship skills. Yeah. And everybody I know who is successful on every level certainly has those kinds of skills. So, you know, the people that really have it going on, Jay, don't have to tell you about it. You can vibe it. You can really, really get the energy and vibe it. But, but that said, there are, certain, there are certain ways that we as social creatures have to interact with other people. So, you know, one thing I teach people is what you wear is hugely important. You want to give off the right energy. Also, wearing something other people can talk about or ask you about. So buttons, pins, little things that you might wear might let a shy person into your energy. Also, when we go to a music industry event, you know, you think about networking in the room or you think about, you talk about the, 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 the piranha after the panel. Well, I don't start networking there. I start networking in the parking lot. Yeah. And have you ever noticed how music people don't really know where they are a lot of the time? <laughs> is this, are we supposed to go, do you know where we're, is this the, I don't know, but let's go find it together. Absolutely. So that's a real good way to do it. Talk about your elevator thing, on the elevator with people, you know, in line, waiting on line. Don't stare at your cell phone. You know what's on your cell phone. Who's standing next to you? Yeah. Like, talk to them, right? So using those kinds of people chops. And when you share history with people, it is a huge piece of, of the thing. You know, if I've seen you before and I see you again, you know, that that's credibility. By the third time I see you, especially at an event, you know, we, we talked. How did it work out for you? We talked in the parking lot. Now I see you on a panel. Now I see you. Third time I see you, baby, we're buds. We're hanging out. So the, the human element of what we as creative people have to do is something that really needs to be addressed on all these different levels. So, you know, I, I can't take somebody who's pathologically shy and turn them into a networking monster, but I can take somebody who has instincts in that direction and help them do what they do. Um, I've been lucky to write three books about that, two versions actually of the first book, Networking in the Music Business, and the contemporary book, which I have out now, which is called Networking Strategies for the New Music Business. Mm -hmm. And it really addresses a lot of the independent world and a lot of the realities of what we have right now. And, uh, you know, again, I, I, I have certain formulas that work for me, but everybody needs to grab onto this and make it work for themselves. But you have to talk to people and you have to practice. So before you go to a music event like IES, see if you can get love from people who ain't going to give you no love. See what you can say to the parking lot attendant to make them smile. See what you can say to that scary woman behind the counter at Whole Foods with the big earrings and the, and the iridescent glasses. What can you say to get her out, out to, to, to react to you? So I practice this all the time. Everywhere I go, I practice communicating with people, caring about people, asking them about them. And that's that's the way it goes. So you really have to, it's like a tennis ball. A conversation goes across the net. It's got to come back to you. So that's the social conditions. So, you know, what do you have in your pocket when you go out? Well, you maybe you got a lighter. Maybe you don't smoke, but somebody else does. Maybe you're going to light their cigarette. Do you have breath mints? That's a good idea in a social situation. Do you have a way? Do you have a business card? How do you take a business card? If somebody hands you a business card, you take it, you look at it, you say something about it. The trick is put it in a place of honor. Do not put that business card next to your ass. Don't put it in your back pocket. It shows dishonor to the card. Do people think about that consciously? Maybe, maybe not. Do they get it subconsciously? Oh, yeah. So there's a lot of little Mm -hmm. things like that that I like to talk about in my networking books that I think really affect where people come from. You know, some of the people you've referenced before, my latest book, which is called It All Begins with the Music, Developing Artists and Careers for the New Music Business. I co-wrote that with the legendary Don Grierson. Oh, yeah. Right. The man who signed Tina Turner, the man who signed Joe Cocker and the man, you know, who who yeah. who, who was the head of A&R at Capital and at right. Epic. Cheap and what, trick and heart. Cheap and all trick those and heart bands, and all yeah. those. And one of the most humble and gracious and gentlemanly men. Yeah. And I, this is after I wrote a book with him. I'm mm-hmm. saying this in the music business. Yeah. And I observed him. I think it's really important when we go to something like IES or a kind of a conference to observe people who are successful. How do they dress? How do they act? How do they treat people? What's their energy? What's around them? You know, how do they communicate? I learned 
I always am le- in that learning mode of, of seeing what that is. But you have to be around this in order to absorb it. You can't get it long distance. So that's the importance of going to events, you know? Yeah, I mean, you can't come on too soft, too strong, no. none of that. you gotta, you got to feel it out. And again, make them want to know more yeah. about you and what you are presenting. There's so many people that come up today. They want to take, take, take. I want a deal. I want this. I, I want you to do this for me. I want that. Like you said, come to the party giving, you yeah. know, giving, you know, being, you know, a very positive force. Because as we know, with three degrees of separation, yeah. anyone you're talking to, it, it could be the, the car attendant or the bathroom maid or whoever, mm-hmm. all of a sudden, guess who they know? Yep. Oh, you don't know who her uncle is? Yep. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's amazing. Um Again, if, if you give a lot of favors, you do a lot, you, you give back. That's why I love speaking at all these uh, events that I've done for so many years. And what led us to create IES is because we think there's an ultimate event still out there, and we want to mold that. It's all independent. It's all entertainment. It's, it's a mixture of creative and technology. It's, it's something new. And, you know, we used to have all these conferences, the Gavin and the Urban Network and the, you know, uh, the BREs. There was just so many of them, and they were all dependent on a major label check yep once those major labels bought each other and your guy at a&m no longer worked there and your person at polygram didn't have the parties they used to throw guess what no we're not sponsoring those anymore and they all went away and there is a new breed just like you say there is a new music and entertainment industry and when we see these guys and i i Hopefully, Dan, you, you can respect this. Uh, Neris has gotten very involved with IS, and we're doing a big panel this year where we're celebrating the independence at the Grammys. And if you don't know, you know now, but the last five albums of the year have gone to artists signed to independent labels. These are independent artists that are winning not only the biggest Grammy of the year, of course, Mumford & Sons this yep. year, but they are selling out tours and, and arenas and festi- headlining festivals and Coachellas and all that of the world and doing it on their terms. Yeah. You know, again, they're, they're really um, successful. They, they may not be as famous as your little pop star, but they're probably making more money. They're in more control of the destiny. And guess what? There's no expiration date. Yeah. on what they do yeah. and that's what's really key so we're talking about networking we're going to go to one more little break here here uh, about indie power again your one-stop shop for promotion marketing distribution you can do it without all that we're going to come back and wrap up with dan Campbell on the road to hollywood Sepultura Soulfly. I'm Brooks Wackman from Bad Religion. Hi, I'm Ronnie James Dio. This is Mick Jones of Florida. Hey, this is Brad Woodrum from Aerosmith, and you got the power. This is Indie Power. It's a good time for new bands. It feels creative at the moment. I mean, it's an exciting time for new musicians and new acts. You know, it's like, a, you know, digital recording and stuff, and it's easier for bands to get a package together. If you're a musician out there, you got a band, you want to rock, don't sit down on your ass and wait for someone to knock on your door. You want to make your own music with Indie Power. You don't need those stinking labels, because once you do it all yourself, you own it all yourself. Indie Power. You don't need the man to do it for you. Get your own music started with Indie Power. That's what I like about being on an independent label, is that I don't have to answer to anybody, and I don't have to, 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 to be somebody that I'm not. I can write the music that I want to write, and I can say the shit that I want to say, and the label puts it out. We wouldn't do it if everyone was telling us what to do. I mean, I think the question is, what aren't the advantages of being independent? You know what I mean? Uh, they definitely pay more attention to you. They definitely care about every single band that they have. And they're personable. I mean, I know every single person at my label. You feel like it's a family and you feel like you have a career. Every decision doesn't have to go through like 20 people, you know. We, it's our record label, which is great. We get to ask ourselves what we think about different ideas. And that's really refreshing. Any advice to young people out there starting bands? Yeah, you just got to get off the couch, make the first move, make it happen, man. You can do it. Do it yourself. Don't be afraid to be your own person and follow your own voice. Never think that you're finished. 
you know, the, the music is always about getting to the next level, you know, because there's always a teacher out there. There's always somebody you can learn something from. You know, no pain, no gain is cliche, but it's true. You got to just work hard and, and keep striving and keep working and believing in yourself and believing in what you're doing. That's the only way to really get anywhere in, in life and in this business. I keep the goals lined up, you know, A, B, C. Keep them lined up, knock them down, achieve something. Follow your heart and, uh, you know, with work you will find a way to get your music out there. There are more ways to get your music out there to people. There's a lot more different, different paths, you know. You know, obviously MySpace, Facebook, that whole thing is a great way for bands to get their names out. You, know, you got a lot of things that, at your disposal to, uh, to get your name out there without spending any money. You can do it yourself. Don't wait for the record label. Do it yourself. We don't need record labels. Do it yourself. DIY all the way, punk rock. Screw all those labels. They don't know what they're doing anyways. We're living proof that you can do it without a record label, without big management, without anything. You can do it yourself. People need to hear the music that's in your head, that's in your fingers, that's in your heart. So get out there and let's hear it. Me and you, we have indie power. Go indie, stay indie, be indie. Get with indie power. This is the place to learn how to do it yourself. You got the power. Indie power. Get off your ass and make it happen and do it yourself. That's what indie power is all about. You have the power to make it happen yourself, so get out there and do it. You have the power. Indie power. Get out there and make it happen. It's all in your hands, so fuck the labels, do it yourself, and uh, long live indie power. We have indie power, and we're going to rock forever. If you have the music inside you, it's in your heart. Make it happen. Get with Indie Power. Declare your independence with Indie Power. Now, if you wait too long for record companies to come to you and make your life happen and your success and your band happen, forget about that. Go to Indie Power. They'll make it happen for you. That's your one-stop shop, Indie Power. Again, without even a record deal, you're going to have all those elements that we just talked about. What is a record company? Well, you can get them all yourself. And as hard as it seems, sometimes finding a backer is the best thing you ever did because, again, you can work out on your terms what that arrangement is. You know, we already know what those terms of the 360 deal and all that is. So hats off to everybody, you know, with the Indie Power team. And we, we look forward to having you, uh, of course, joining us at IES this year. Uh, our guest has been Dan Compel. Dan, uh, give us a list of a few of your top books that you haven't mentioned yet and why it's important for the readers and the viewers here to check those out and where they can find them. Sure, Jay. I mentioned uh, I mentioned networking strategies for the new music business, which is sort of a primer of uh, personal relationship skills. Uh, for Hal Leonard Books, I wrote a book called How They Made It, True Stories of How Music's Biggest Stars Went from Start to Stardom. It follows signing stories of 41 major artists across all genres based on my interviews with those artists. So... That uh, is an interesting book. It all begins with the music, developing artists and careers for the new music business with Don Grierson, 85 interviews with the top movers and shakers in the business, and then my book, Electrify My Soul, Songwriters and the Spiritual Source. They're all at Amazon.com, and you can visit my website at www.dankimpel.com and become my friend on Facebook even. That's great. We, you know, being a student of the game, I can never get enough. And and what's amazing, I'm celebrating my 40th year in the business professionally. Doesn't count the years as a player. So you can imagine the the love I have to have this amount of energy, you know, moving forward. But it's, you know, it's every day I wake up. I can't wait to get on the internet. I can't wait to learn something more. I can't wait to go to that conference or class or meet that person or have that phone call that inspires me to the next project, the next level. And it's pretty much the mindset you got to have, you know, uh, is not a quick buck industry. Those that, that we all respect in this business have done it for many, many years and have persevered. A lot of people want the shortcut. How do I get famous and, and how do I get rich? You know, well, there's, there's, you know, neither one of those that comes quick is ever good. So uh, it's, all about learning. We definitely, like I say, want to see you at IES this year. And IESFest.com is the website. And we have all sorts of uh, information for you. And you, we know you were in Michigan last year, but you've got to reroute those uh, those weather plans and be at IES this year. It's five days, so I know you can plug in wherever you can. We, we'd be blessed to have you there. We look forward to having your energy join the energy of all these incredible trailblazers and innovators and bring the attendees what I think is truly, 
you know, millions and millions of dollars worth of opportunities. Because already from last year's event, people have gotten tours and they got this deal and they hooked up that and this producer came out of that for collaboration and they're moving and shaking. And, and you know somebody in a minute is going to be the next, you know, Macklemore or Tech Nine or Joe Bonamassa or someone. And all of a sudden they got a multi-million dollar career and it all started, you know, right at IES. So we look forward to having you, Dan. Cool. Thank you, Jay. Thank you so much for joining us this week. Stay tuned again for The Road to Hollywood next week where we've got more guests, more information, and we look forward to seeing you then. Thank you so much for tuning in. Entertainment Summit, IES.